we're on a journey on Romans Road, and uh, we're going to talk today about judging rightly. And if we look at what we've picked up, um, where we picked up last week, we're at the end of chapter 1. And at the end of chapter 1, Romans 1 ends with a descriptive of those who have forsaken the truth, have chosen to live a repentant, sinful life, and have been given over to a depraved mind. And what happened in this Romans culture was there was a group of Gentiles who were somewhat good people, um, living a somewhat religious life. And then there was a Jewish community that were religious people living a somewhat good life, and they were judgmental of each other. And not only were they judgmental of each other, but they were judgmental of each other while both thinking each one of their groups were just okay with God. And that's where we pick things up today. And the ability to judge rightly is not just something that 2,000 years ago in a Roman culture was necessary, but it's necessary today. I think one of the things that we need to continue to grow in and learn as a Christian community is the ability to judge rightly, not only in being able to judge each other according to the scriptures righteously so that we can help each other along, but I think it starts with a righteous judgment and critique of ourselves. And we often don't take time to, skip, to still our hearts before a holy God and have Him judge the core of who we are right down to all of our actions. You know, the scriptures say that we will give an account for every careless word that leaves our mouths. Down to every word. Does that not deem the necessity for each one of us to take some time to judge all of our life, to judge all of our actions, and to judge it rightly according to the word of truth so that we might not live a life that is less than all of the grandeur that God would have for us, that was less than all of the greatness and the power that he would want us to experience. And if we don't judge rightly internally, we will not be in a position to help each other as we judge one another, not with a judgmental heart, but with a righteous heart trying to help each other along this journey. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 says this, You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Let's pray and then let's break this passage down. Father God, again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to just participate, Lord, with you and your Holy Spirit as you move in our presence and as we come corporately together to worship you, Lord. I am thankful that we have the opportunity to just get together and to glorify your name, to exalt your name, Lord Jesus Christ, to praise you, our Father in heaven. And I pray that as we do that through song and through the word, that we would be open to your truth, that we would be open to your reality, the only one that matters. And I pray, Lord, that as you teach us today about judgment, internally and externally, that we would see it for what it is, and that we would be willing, Lord, to reevaluate where we are with you, where we are individually, where we are in our small groups, where we are corporately, so that we might place ourselves in a position to better honor you, to better glorify you, to better praise you. Lord, I pray, as I always do, that you would have your way with our hearts, and that you would just work in our lives. 
And I pray, Lord, that as we look at this section of your word, that you would be the teacher, that I'd move out of the way, Lord, and allow you to speak powerfully through your word, living and active in each one of our lives, Lord. And I pray also, Lord, that if there are those who are hurting, who are struggling, who are battling this morning, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would comfort us and show us your deep, sincere care for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Judge me not. Probably a statement that is worded slightly differently than that, but how many times has we, have we as Christians either said or heard people say within our Christian circles, you can't judge me. You can't judge me. And what we're going to learn is that there is a righteous judgment that is necessary in each one of our lives for our growth and our walk with God. And then there is a wrongful judgment that is built on wrongful pretense, that is built on wrongful judgment, wrong basis, is not truth, that will do great damage. And so let's look at what was going on in the Roman culture because there's much for us to learn. You, therefore, have no excuse. Now, he had just told those pagans, the people who had been given over to a depraved mind, he had just told them that they were without excuse to see the mighty God of creation within creation, and they had no excuse. No excuse to not recognize him. No excuse to not acknowledge him. No excuse to not follow him just by creation alone. And now he says to those who thought maybe they were above that or were better than that because they weren't them, they weren't that group, you therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. You see, judgment isn't the problem. It's judging someone while you're doing the very same thing that you're judging them for. We have the Jewish community judging the Gentiles. We have the Gentile community judging the Jewish community. Both thought they were okay because they were religious or generally good people. And they weren't those people that were at the end of chapter 1. And so they felt like they were okay. They felt like they were right in their judgment. But yet the scripture says, the problem's not judgment, but the problem is because you, Pat's judgment, do the same things. You're saying they're wrong for doing what you are doing. And sometimes we do that. We want to make a judgment on another believer's life, on a brother or sister's life, for whatever it is that they're doing, and we are doing the very same thing. Maybe we hide our poor decision a little better than they do, but we do the same thing. That's not a righteous judgment. That's not a right judgment. We often judge others based on perception and not on truth. We judge them based on a pretense that we might hold. We judge them based on a former action that they may have taken only to prove that we have not truly forgiven that which they've done. Because we're still holding that against their account. And we err in our judgment. Not that what they're doing is not wrong. It very well may be. But we have to make sure that not only our actions are right, but that our attitude is right in order to make a judgment in their life that will help them and minister to them. But that's not what was going on in this passage. We had two groups that had falsely believed that they were secure because of outward practices, and both groups were not in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and were sorely mistaken on their judgment. And yet they were judging people for doing certain things when they themselves were doing those very same things. I think it all begins with an improper and inaccurate judgment of ourselves. It really does. The Jews were making judgments on the Gentiles 
And the Jews were looking down on those pagan communities and they were glad that they weren't them, but they were also glad that they weren't these Gentiles who were generally decent people surrounding them. And they were judging out of pride. They were posturing themselves out of pride and out of arrogance and thinking they were better. And then you had these Gentiles who were not those pagans either, although some, the Jews, would consider them all pagans. But you had these Gentiles, non-Jewish people, making judgments on that same group of people who were abase in their actions and vile in their actions. And then they were judging the Jews and saying, we're glad we're not them also. And I don't think that's very far off from how we do things sometimes today looks a little differently, but we do it even within our Christianity. Now, I'm all about doctrine. Doctrine's important. It's the basis of which we discern and make decisions, and so doctrine is important. But I think sometimes we make judgments because we're not them. You know, I can't believe that the assembly of God does things that way. I can't believe, you know, that that church does things that way. And we start majoring on the minors rather than focusing in on the fact that they're teaching the same gospel, the same repentance and faith that we're teaching. Now, we have the privilege to make decisions in this church for the doctrine that we'll follow based upon the word of God and that's where our responsibility begins and that's where our responsibility ends. And the diversity in the body of Christ is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. When it's undoctrinal, when it's wrong, it's a bad thing. But when it's based on preferences, which is usually where I see people make wrong judgments in the area of preferences, we have problems. There is Christian freedom in each one of our lives. And I don't have to do things like Michael does. And Mark doesn't have to do things like Jeff does. And Butch doesn't have to do things like somebody else does. And Kayla doesn't have to do things like Kathy does. There's a baseline of truth that holds us all to the same standard. But there is freedom in our decision making. And in our Christianity there is freedom that as long as we're between the guardrails we're okay but it can look greatly different between those guardrails. And we need to be cautious that we don't make judgment based on our preferences and that we're judging each other based upon truth. And we'll look at that concept in just a minute and how that works. In verse 2 it says, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Truth, truth is the only accurate basis for righteous judgment. It's not feelings. Because our feelings change. It's not preference. Because I don't know about you. But my preferences have changed. As I've aged. And as I've grown. And as I've matured. And it's not just the things that I like or don't like. That we judge things on. And it's not based on the people I, I tend to have the same common interests in. And those that I get. It's not based on any of that. God gives us an example here. In verse 2, and when it says that we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. If we are not making proper judgment in one another's lives based on truth, we are judging improperly. And if we are making judgments on those who are doing things a little differently than us and it's not sin, we are not judging properly. Because there's room for that. And I would tell you that not only is there room, there's need for that. There is need for a diversity of forms and methodology of worship. There is a need for diversity in how we approach God. There is need for different types of churches. And there's strengths and weaknesses that come with some of those differences. But we need not judge when it's not sinful. We need to recognize the strength of those differences. And they weren't seeing that. And I think sometimes we don't see that. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, and here's the problem, and yet do the same things, 
Do you think you will escape God's judgment? How many times have we done that? Where we are making a judgment, and it may be accurate in someone else's life, and we see the wrong that they're doing, but we do not see the same wrong that we're doing. And we think we're okay. It goes back again to not the fact that the speck doesn't need to be removed from their eye. It's just that we have to remove the plank from our eye first so that we might see rightly to help them overcome. And we can't help them overcome rightly when we're stuck in the same thing and approaching them with an arrogant, pretentious judgment, thinking we're better than they are. So do you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things? Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience. That's a strong statement. Not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance. This is a verse of grace right here. And we need not miss it. How gracious has God been with us as we struggle through some of the sin in our lives. And it says very clearly here that his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience. His kindness leads us towards repentance. And if he is not making a stern judgment, it may not be time for us to make a stern judgment in one another's lives. And we might leave room for his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience to work in that person's life. Because just like God's kindness leads us towards repentance, it does the same in their life too. I believe that the timing of helping, buddy, some, by, of helping somebody with a proper righteous judgment in their life, timing is the key. God is not forever tolerant of sin in our lives. There's a time. There's a time when he calls us to account. There's also a time when through his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience, he allows us the freedom to figure it out and get it right. And he leads us towards repentance on our own. And I think sometimes we say the right thing at the wrong time. Sometimes we say the wrong thing at the right time. But timing is of the essence. And timing is a Holy Spirit thing. And I've learned that when I'm trying to walk into somebody's life because of knowing that the time is right and God is prompting me through the Holy Spirit, that they will discern more times than not if my attitude and heart is right in what I'm bringing to the table and what I'm speaking to them about. Because wrongful judgment is often based on pride and an attitude that's wrong, an attitude of being better than the other person, and therefore it's not perceived. When the truth of the matter is we need to approach them as God leads, but we need to make sure we're not A, involved in the same thing, and that we're there for ministry and the uplifting of the individual, not for tearing them down. Let's look at the most classic example, I believe, from the Old Testament of this instance, of this type of an occurrence. It's in 2 Samuel 12, and I'm sure you're familiar with the story, um, Nathan and David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. The word for mercy is there. He had no pity. Now, 
His judgment's not off. His assessment of the situation's not off. Up to this point, David is making a proper assessment of the situation at hand. It was wrong for the rich man to take the poor man's only ewe lamb and to use it when he had a bountiful stock of animals that he could have chose from. Then David, Nathan said to David, You the man! You are the man. That's the original. You are the man right there. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. Get this. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Remember the story. He sent him to the front of the battle and then withdrew troops from him. God held that to his account, to David's account. And took his wife to be your own. We know the story with Bathsheba. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. In other words, you are the guy that I was talking about. David spoke through, or God spoke through Nathan to David, and he was doing the very thing that he was quick to make a judgment on. Was his assessment wrong of the situation? I don't believe at all. The problem is, he was doing the same thing. Different set of circumstances, but he was stealing that which was not his. And it led him to even more grave decisions. Decisions that were against the Holy God. He had judged rightly in one sense, externally, but he had failed to take the time to judge rightly internally. And the two have to work in harmony. They have to work in harmony. If I have not taken the time to judge rightly internally, I am foolish to think that I can see things accurately externally with all that is involved. And we need to understand that. Now some of you are thinking this morning, well, I still don't think it's my right to judge others. Let's look at the end of the passage from 1 Corinthians 5. And you should go back, which we can't do for the sake of time, and read the entire chapter. But it says in verse 12, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? What right do I have to judge those who don't know Christ? The answer is none. I have no right and that's what the Roman church was doing. It was making some judgments that were towards those who were outside of the grace of God, who were outside of the kingdom. And then you also had the picture of the lost also making judgment against one another and against the Christians too. But we can't control that. But what right, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church. Are not lost people going to act like lost people? And should we expect anything else from them? I am utterly amazed when I watch people who don't know Christ act like and hold Christian values. It amazes me. I am seeing it on a regular basis right now in the flow of my life where I am watching some individuals who do not know Christ act more godly than some Christians that are in my life. I'm amazed at it. I stand there in awe sometimes that they can make those decisions apart from being led of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not making a judgment of whether they're in Christ or not. They'll tell you they're not. They'll say it. They know they're not. So we have no business. 
business judging those outside the church. The business we have with them is being a godly example and sharing the gospel of repentance and faith with them. That is the business we have with them. Are you not to judge those inside? And the answer is a very strong yes. Are you not to judge rightly? Is the context. Those inside. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Remember the scenario? A man had taken his stepmother. A son had taken his stepmother into his bed. It was a wrong happening. It was all going on. And they, the Corinthian church was not dealing with it. They were worried about what was going on outside of the church body. Outside of those who did not know Christ. And they weren't taking care of business inside. We have the responsibility, whether we like it or not, to judge righteously in each other's lives. It still needs to be led of the Holy Spirit. It still needs to be with a humble attitude. It still needs to be at the right time. But it needs to be done. If you see me walking in unrepentant sin, it is your responsibility as the Lord leads you to speak to me about it and not to ignore it. It is our responsibility to do that with each other. But we must be sure that we're dealing with sin and not preferences. Because that is where great damage is done. I've watched Christian relationships be ended because people dug a hard line on a preference that could not be defined by Scripture. I've watched rich friendships end rapidly because of people digging in on a preference digging in on their choice and thinking that everybody needs to do what they do when it was not a clear-cut black and white issue in Scripture. And we need to be cautious. We need to be cautious. Early in my walk with the Lord, I definitely did not discern in this area rightly. I thought, because I was doing it, everybody should be doing it. I thought if that was my choice, every Christian should make that choice. And I was unable to see clearly the freedom between the guardrails. I was unable to see the, the room for preferences that differed within a righteous path. And there's great damage that comes if we tow a line that God didn't call us to tow. But it does not excuse us from that choice of righteously judging one another with a humble attitude and a right heart in helping each other be overcomers. It does not excuse it. We need to have harmony in our viewpoint of what righteous judgment looks like, and we need to know the right time. And again, I will stress that timing is of the essence. It is. I think it's the most important aspect, is being led of the Lord in the right moment. The second point is no favoritism here. But because of your stubbornness, and that word literally means the hardening of an artery. It's a pretty strong word. Because of your stubbornness, because you're dug in, because you can't see any other way, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. Continued unrepentance, repeated over and over again, will end ultimately in wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. You see, when I read the book of 1 John, it tells me over and over again that the Christian's general flow of life will be righteousness. It will be. It tells me over and over again that if someone claims to be in Christ but yet the general flow and pattern of their life is ungodliness that they are not in Christ. It's what it says. I'm not saying it. It's what it says. I also see that those who over and over again make choices that are unrighteous no matter what they claim with their mouth are proving who they truly are which is they are not in Christ. 
It doesn't say that a single sin separates us from the kingdom of God. It doesn't say that Christians don't sin. But it paints a picture in the book of 1 John very clearly, more clear to me than anywhere in the whole of scriptures, that those who are in Christ will generally have practices, actions that are righteous. And yet we're surrounded in our nation by a people who 85% at minimum in the 90s on some surveys claim to be Christian, but yet our actions are not Christian-like. And there's much deception. We looked last week at self-deception throughout that whole text. And there's great self-deception. We are not Christian because we say we are. We are Christian because we've yielded to the Lord. And because we've made Him Master, Boss, Savior. And there is a result that will take place in our life if we truly are in Christ. Perfect? No. Aiming for? Yes. Sinful? Sometimes? Yes. Repentant? Always. A general pattern of growth and becoming more godly? Yes. And it becomes difficult because there's many who I believe will fall into his ultimate wrath. Living a life of self-deceit because they said some prayer one time in their life that had no impact and no change in their lives. But at some point in VBS when they were five years old they said a prayer and they've been told that they're okay. Even though there's been no repentance and no faith that's truly taken place. And it's evident by the general flow of their life. Because of your stubbornness of your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will give to each person according to what he has said, according to what he has done. You see, Paul's not shifting gears on us here in Romans and saying that now salvation is by works. What he's simply saying is that our works will prove who we are. They will prove where our allegiance lies. They will prove whether we are in the kingdom or not in the kingdom. Our actions prove that. And God will give to each person according to what he has done, according to his actions, because his actions are in line with who he is. Whether he's in Christ or not. To those who by persistence, I love that word, to those whose general flow of life, to those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Why? Because they did good works? No, because their good works confirm that they were truly in him. That they were truly born again. That they were truly redeemed. And notice the key word there, to those who by persistence, to those whose general flow of life is glory, honor, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And this is talking about final wrath and anger. This is talking about the great white throne judgment. And that first section of verse 7 is talking about the Bema Seat judgment. One for the Christian and then the great white throne for the non-Christian. Two forms of judgment. There will be trouble and distress for every human, for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Remember, you had the Jews and the Gentiles who were thinking they were okay because they were good people. Because they had some form of religious activity. Because they weren't those pagans with the depraved mind. They thought that they were okay. But there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. 
And again, he's not shifting gears. He's not saying salvation is now by works. He is simply saying that the general pattern of life will confirm where a person's heart lies. For God does not show favoritism. Salvation does not come by action, but actions demonstrate where one stands. It does not matter whether you are a Jewish person, a Gentile person. It does not matter where you've come from. It does not matter what your ethnicity is. It does not matter what your past is. It does not matter what you've had or what you have not had. What matters is have you decided in your heart to follow Jesus? Are you a Christian? And is it confirmed by a persistent lifestyle that says yes? By actions that confirm the decision of your heart. In 1 Corinthians 11, and we'll end with this, it says, That is why many among you are weak and sick. And remember, this is the chapter in which the Lord's Supper is explained in detail and how it should be practiced. That is why many among you, and he's talking to Christians, the Corinthian church, are weak and sick. And a number of you have fallen asleep. A number of you have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. There were Christians in the Corinthian church who were taking the Lord's Supper without properly judging themselves and making right sin in their lives. And there were some who were weak, some who were sick, some who had died because of not making a proper judgment within their own lives and getting things right before a holy God. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. All proper judgment begins internally. All of it does. It begins inside. And if I make a proper judgment of the actions in my life and correct those that are wrong, I could escape God's judgment. Now for the Christian, it's not his final judgment in which we would face damnation because we're in Christ. But his judgment that can take place on the unrepentant sin in my life if I persist. But if I judge rightly and I take care of matters, I don't have to face that. Because he's a gracious and merciful God. And if I judge rightly here, I will be more apt to judge rightly here among one another. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? None. But are we not to judge those inside? We need to judge rightly. And we need to take it seriously. I'm looking forward to what lies ahead of us in the book of Romans. But I think we need to digest what we've been given thus far before Paul moves on to other topics. And we need to understand that the shared Christian life is the standard that God expects of us. And we have a duty and a responsibility to one another to share that life. Father, thank you for the clear picture that you've painted for us. Thank you that you've given us a standard of your truth through which we can make proper judgment. I pray, Lord, that we would not judge out of arrogance or out of thinking we're better than somebody, but that we would judge rightly first the actions in our own life and then the actions in those who are our brothers and our sisters' lives, all so that we might glorify you further by being overcomers of the sin that still so easily entangles. I pray, Lord, that we would walk alongside one another. That we would not ignore the problems and the struggles and the sin that we have in our lives, but we'd help each other through it. That we'd be truly committed to one another. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would take a proper assessment of our own lives to see if the general pattern of our life is one of righteousness or if it is one of repetitive and unrepentant sin so that we might know where we stand with you. And then, Lord, once assessing that properly, that we would take the right action and that we'd live for you and for your glory. We praise you, Father, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.